I'd probably drank maybe a quarter of a cup of her blood, and it made me feel euphoric. It was like tasting pure power. Pretty much drinking blood was the only option. I've had people tell me that my blood tastes really good to them. A lot of people would want to be involved in touching the blood or actually drinking the blood. If I could stop drinking blood, I definitely would. When I was asked to make a film about real-life vampires in America, I had no idea what to expect. Could there really be people out there drinking human blood, especially in an age where blood-borne diseases like AIDS and hepatitis are commonplace and the risks are so high? The scene I unearthed both surprised and shocked me. My journey begins in New York, where the goth scene clearly reflects America's fascination with the dark side. Over the last decade, this scene has splintered, diversified and branched out into various subsets. One of these subsets is the vampire community. When I heard about this scene, images of the Hollywood stereotype flashed through my mind. But these people have taken the sexual license, charisma and transcending qualities of the vampire and made it their own. Even just walking down the street in broad daylight, you can run into self-identified vampires. It seems teenagers, especially outcasts, are attracted to the vampire scene because it seems to offer them stability, a sense of belonging, as well as being a rebellious alternative to normal society. The vampire scene was um, the icing on the cake for me. Pretty much most of us just been like the outskirts, like the outcast of families who need something and look for other ways to belong. The things I tell people when they tell me that I'm a freak, I'm a vampire, I'm whatever they call me, all I say is, well, I am who I am and you are who you are. If you don't like it, it's too bad. People, they say, why is he looking all weird and all? And usually my first response is, why do you look so normal? My parents basically think that, you know, I have issues because of the way I act. You know, they, they think that, you know, if I don't follow their footsteps that I'm queer, I'm gay, I have issues, you know, I need to go to a mental hospital because there's something wrong with me because I choose to express myself differently than most people. Most teenagers are referred to as role players because they like to dress up, hang out in gangs, and for the most part are pretty harmless. But I had heard that there were people called lifestylers who took their roles much more seriously, even to the point where they drank human blood. The teenagers I met told me about a costume shop downtown where I would find a lifestyler who specializes in making fangs. This is Halloween Adventure, you know, it's one of the largest costume shops and special effects shops in the city. We have a lot of interesting stuff for the um, Halloween season, which we are in right now. So it's very busy right now, very busy. We get every, all different types of people come in here. I mean, you know, police officers, doctors, lawyers, performers, everything. It's, it's, uh, there's a lot of, uh, a lot of stuff that supplies the, the need that's out there, and it's all under one roof. There's a definite vampire community that does exist all around the world in different areas. New York has a rather large one. I'm sure there are other areas that have even bigger communities. Vincent told me that he'd been in the scene for years. I thought he might know about blood drinking, or perhaps he'd even drunk blood himself. As far as... Um, Drinking the drinking of blood within, you know, and the, the fact that hey, we're all vampires. Vampires drink blood. Yes. Um, most for the most part, it don't happen. For the most part, many people don't 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 do that. You know, it's too dangerous. Now, if it's something that's done in your personal, you know, in in, in a, an appropriate place, you're doing it for as part of a ritual or something like that. And hey, it's it, that's what you do. Blood drinking has been something that's been around for eons. Do you yourself drink blood? Um, I have, I have, and, and, and you know, and I, and like I said, for me, it's something. It's a, it's, it's a sharing, and that's only done. I've only maybe had maybe two or three individuals in my time who I've deemed worthy in my eyes to drink of mine and I drink of theirs. You know, it's, it's, and even then, it's not, it's not a lot. I mean, a pinprick is all that I feel is necessary. You know, like I said, I know people who want to like and just, you know, have a glass full, you know, like a beer, you know, that's, to me, that's not, that's over, overdoing, it's not, it's not, it's not the proper way. 
I then followed Vincent to a hidden room at the back of the shop, known only as the Transfertorium. So we try to keep it well hidden behind our little pink kimono here, secret door. <laughs> they tell us what fangs they want, what style. We get, take them in the back and we take a dental impression, which is, you know, we take the impression, put stone in it, this is basically what the person's teeth look like. And then I take acrylic and I mold it to the teeth. Then I shave them down from this till they look kind of like that. Like this is a really bad example of a, of a fang, but this is the only thing I have laying around right now. But we carve it down to somewhat of a shape, like a pointed shape. Season is around Halloween. Automatically, everybody wants fangs because everybody wants to be a vampire following and everybody wants to have the best costume. But the cheapest set we have is the classic canine, which is on the canine teeth, or the Lilith, which is right next to the canine, right, more prominent in front. I am the only person who has blood grooves in my fangs. In fact, I'll show you. Just take these off. blood groove right here. Basically, like, it's a, I like knives. Like, I'm big on knives and weaponry and stuff. A knife, when you, or a fang, is a stabbing weapon. When you stab, you know, it acts like a cork. When you pull release from the body, the skin closes and that doesn't release a lot of blood. This, you stick it right in and keep it in and the blood will come out through the blood groove. That's what the blood groove is. I just think it's a very intimidating look, and I thought it would be cool if it could be done. So I had to make it. I don't drink blood, but whatever, you know, it's still a pretty cool look. As Sinner sat there filing down fangs, I wondered if he was curious about what kind of people bought them and what they might use them for. Do I look at people and wonder what they're gonna use the fangs for? Uh, sometimes. It depends on what they're really talking about back here. It depends on how they look. Some people, you can look at them and just tell they're using this for a costume party. There's a costume party going on, and they want to be the one with the best costume. Other people come back here and it's just like, I really wonder what they're doing. You know, I wonder what they plan, plan on doing with these fangs. Leaving Sinner and wandering around the shop, I met someone else who made me realize that the vampire scene is more than just a dress code and could be potentially dangerous. I am very intimate with my blood drinking. It generally tends to be something that, to enhance sex. Um, maybe a bite in the thigh area, very close to an arterial vein, kind of go from there. I, I would say I've been drinking a lot more lately because I've been getting more and more intimate with my girlfriend. And she has kind of a vampire fetish. <laughs> Ghost told me that he performs within the vampire club scene, which has its own preferred entertainment for those who can stomach it. Tomorrow evening, we are doing what is known as a full stigmatic crucifixion. We are doing all five injuries of Christ. We are doing the whip lashings, the nails through the palms, the nails through the feet, the crown of thorns, the heart slash. We're also going to be doing piercings along my mouth cheekbones, through my cheeks, my ears, and through my eyebrows, making it appear as if my face has been sewn shut. What's going to happen tonight? Blood, mayhem, destruction, the end of it all. The party that's here tonight is a pretty much a very large gathering of my fellow family members, you know, the, the vampire scene. Yeah, of course, there are a lot of people here who have not been here before. They're going to see a show that's very risque. People who are, are relatively new to what's going on tonight, we're going to see things for the first time. you got to experience it one time before you know whether you like it or not. What we're going to be doing in the center tonight is going to be transforming him into Pinhead from Hellraiser. Well, I have to shave my hair up so they can you know, paint my whole head up and put needles in it. <laughs> the character in the film that we're transforming him into is bald yeah. completely, has no body hair of any sort, white skin with a grid painted on him, and 
needles at every cross section. Yeah, it might turn them off, they might leave, but then it might awaken something in them that will want them to see more and more of what that entertainment is. Tonight, as part of the performance, I'll be having, I do believe, will be 17 needles uh, inserted into my arms and back with feathers attached to it. It's sort of a transformation, whereas um, <clears throat> I'm being given wings. My parents don't really mind what I do as long as I'm not um, killing children or small animals or doing some other horribly immoral act. They don't mind, they, they think of me as an individual and they haven't decided to disown me yet, so I assume that they're pretty okay with what I do. I am 19 years old. Vampire community to us is a, a tight-knit family. We all get along together, we like to hang out together. This is why we have the type of clubs where people can come and enjoy this type of thing. We have a mixed group. We have people that are vampire enthusiasts that don't actually engage in any vampiric activities, but they like the aesthetic of the vampire world. They like dressing a certain way, they like wearing fangs, they like listening to music that is associated with the gothic vampire community. Of course there are people that will actually engage in some ritualistic vampire practices, but it's not a publicized thing. So people keep that to themselves. Have you guys drunk blood before? Yes. We have drunk blood before, absolutely. Um, but you know, it's from people that we know, friends, willing volunteers, no, never just run out in the street and bite somebody's neck and argh, not like that. Some people actually will exchange blood between partners. In a lot of cases, it's a relationship type of bond where there may be two people that care about each other deeply that exchange blood in a way to have a bond with each other. I would like to be viewed as a vampire, but I would never actually want people to know whether or not I was drinking blood because I like the mystique. I like the fact that people would look at me and say, wow, she looks like a vampire. I wonder if she actually is one. As the desire for blood performance art increases in vampire clubs, I discovered that the line between entertainment and self-mutilation can easily become blurred. I hear a lot of people saying, oh my God, it's crazy. How could you put a thousand needles through your skin? How could you bleed all over the place and paint walls with it? And, um, how could you drink it and share it and this and any other thing? But hey, if they don't want to deal with it, that's, that's their loss, not mine. I'm always taking every show as far as I possibly can. I've gotten to points where it's, it's gotten really close to passing out. Um, I, I have a high tolerance, I'm used to it. It's, this is something I do overnight. During the days is where I make my money and I do piercings and uh, minor implants and scarification. What we're doing is piercing a lip web, which is under the top lip, which holds her lip to her palate. I don't step into anything I don't think I can walk away from. In the beginning is all the basic stuff, male nipples, verticals and horizontals, female nipples, and then into navels, double navels, triple navels, horizontal navels, just all different style navel piercings that are done. I've been involved in relationships where blood has been involved for quite a while, quite a while, so ever since like my early teens, since originally first dating. All facial piercings, wow. ear piercings, earls, double earls. It all started way back, back in the day with the sitting in the clubhouse with all the boys and slitting our thumbs open and becoming blood brothers, you know, that was, that was actually probably what kicked it in originally. Tongue webbings, snake bites, double tongues. People seem to fear blood and body fluids and this and any other thing, not understanding that a lot of your body fluids, be it blood or semen or, or urine or anything like that, um, it, it held uh, it held rights in other in other situations. It, it's more than just a it's more than just a body fluid. You know, people don't understand that nowadays. They're afraid of it because of the society that they're in, because of the movies they they see, and because of the news that they watch on TV. And um, they either display blood with disease or death or, 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 or pain or you know and stuff like that and um, which leads back to the fact again that they just they're, they're forgetting what it's really about and you know they're, they're really they're being tuned out by everything around them it's keeping them away from what's real you know and um, it's a shame it's a real shame and that's why I keep it going by doing bloodlettings and doing implants and doing needle play and doing blood art and stuff like that um, I do it so that it gets out there. What I do is very visual. First we start off with uh, some drum play, and uh, that's just to bring the people, the, the room's energy up. After, after a few minutes of drum playing, and then I'll go into a needle play, and that'll start me into a small state-like trance. That'll just wake up all my endorphins and 
I'll do as many needles as I possibly can in the length of time I have to do it. Where the needles are placed and the pattern that they're placed all has meaning to it. After we do a needle play, we'll do a bloodletting and uh, we'll try to collect up as much blood as possible. After a certain point in time, your arms and your legs kind of get a little numb. Your face will get really numb and then you'll start getting tunnel vision. It's a fine line between being awake and not being awake due to the amount of blood in your body. It's a very fine line. Once you're not awake, if you continue to bleed after not being awake, then that's the end of that. You really don't have much more to go to there before you just won't be able to wake up out of it. Have you ever come that close? I try to as much as possible, yeah. I try to force the factor as much as possible, but still within guidelines of making sure that I can pull out of it if I have to. A lot of people during performances would want to be involved in the blood play, be it whether touching the blood or rubbing the blood on themselves or actually drinking the blood. For the rest of their lives, my my blood and my genetic code and everything is now in their body. I get called for it, you know, it's, if they want it, they can have it. Anyone for the first time cannot just grab a glass of blood and drink it down. You know, your, your body would reject it, so you'd probably get really sick the first couple of times. I'll only share blood when the blood is fresh. After the bloodletting, uh, my girlfriend uh, paints with the blood. And she does artwork and paint on background canvas. or. So just grab something out of the room and start painting with it or on it or whatever the case is. I don't get paid for this. I don't make money. Um, sometimes some of the artwork I'll make money on, whatever the case is. Um, I do live in New York. I do have food to eat and I do have bills to pay. Um, but as far as rituals go, as far as sacrifice goes, as far as blood play goes, as far as all that goes, I'm always taking every show as far as I possibly can. Pretty much taking it to the limit on my own extent, try, trying, to, trying to get my pleasure out of it as much as possible. I'm alive, so it's, I haven't done anything that wrong yet. The west coast of America has a thriving vampire scene, so I left New York and headed for Los Angeles. My first encounter just outside LA was with a girl who has an exceptional role within the blood drinking community. The Near Dark Pub is a vampire bar out in Hollywood. Every year they name a new spigot girl. A spigot out here is considered to be a place where water runs out of. They call that a spigot. That's why they gave me that nickname. And maybe because I was the one that donated the most blood within a certain amount of time and made bumper stickers after it too. When I went to school, no, I wasn't popular. I knew all the outcasts. The popular kids didn't like me, and I just didn't like them either. One of the groups that I did hang out with at my school were um, the basic goth group. They were a major outcast. I mean, they didn't hang out with anybody else. As I further got into the goth scene, I was with a vampire goth friend of mine, and we were talking about how she had a donor which she drank blood from. and. It was a really close friend of hers, and I decided why not. So that's when I started, and I let her drink for me. What did she do? She cut me, and from there she just drank my blood. Being drank from, it's not exactly a reality type um, high. It's a spiritual, high, relaxed type feeling. I've been donating blood for about five years, ever since I was 15. Do your parents know what you do? Um, actually, no, they don't. <laughs> my parents have no idea. Uh, my mother has seen my scars before, but she asked me what happened, and I'd tell her, oh, I accidentally scraped myself when I was picking up a box or something like that. I wouldn't exactly tell her how I got it. Tonight is Halloween and I'm going to the Near Dark Pub in Hollywood. It takes me about an hour and a half to two hours to get there depending on traffic. 
Everybody gathers there from around the area of Hollywood and drinks and has fun and also drinks blood. We are now walking into the near dark pub. is actually a lot of fun. They play a lot of industrial and goth type music. They have candles everywhere and they also do other unusual things like uh, light fires in the bar. When I go there and I donate, I'll go up to one of my friends and just say, hey, you know, do you want to go out back and or do you want me to donate? And usually we'd talk for a second and then we'd go, usually into a dark back corner and go ahead and do it, or donate blood. She's had clothes on, she's been in a smoky place, so anything that's going to go into her body is going to pick up anything that's on the surface of her skin and would wind up going into her. So first, first we have to sterilize the area. <laughs> right over here? Is that good? Mm -hmm. Right there? Sure. All right. Have you fed from Amanda in the past, Sue? Yes, I have fed off Amanda before. She's very nice and sweet. Whenever I donate, my friends use on me diabetic needles or sometimes they use razors or knives. I've had people tell me that my blood is tastes really good to them. It's not bad or bitter. to drink that blood. It feels very, very, very good. <laughs> it takes a while for the effects of it to take effect, but the beginning of it, the actual taking feels very, very good because it's the foreknowledge. I know what I'm going to feel like in just a little while. And that should do. I don't want to take too much. On donating blood, I would do it not all the time. I had to stop uh, because of my scars because I had too many of them and they weren't all the way healed yet. And I didn't want to get myself cut up anymore until those other ones healed because it'd be just having to handle every single one of them all the time and just, I don't want to have to deal with having to patch myself up all the time. <laughs> yeah, we're gonna go back in now and rejoin everyone. I've been told that finding donors in the vampire community is not easy, and Amanda is considered extremely valuable for those like Sue, who refer to themselves as blood addicts. Even though there is no addictive component in human blood, feeding any type of craving can be rewarding psychologically, and some people will go to extraordinary lengths to do so. Some of the times when I'm feeding, I do lose myself. It could almost be compared to when a drunk blacks out. I have cut a couple of people very badly. They have had to go to the hospital and get stitches. There was one person that myself and another person were feeding off of, and we both weren't paying attention, and she wound up um, very weak from blood loss. One time I had, I had cut myself pretty badly and normal reaction is you take your, oh, I cut myself, stick your hand in your mouth and suck the blood. And I thought to myself, wait, that actually tastes pretty good. And I actually sucked down quite a bit. This friend of mine at school had actually offered to cut herself and I said, sure, I'll try it. So she cut herself and I drank probably about a quarter of a cup of blood off of her. And it was very, very strange because it was, the, it was the same effect as before, only it was much more powerful. I felt very euphoric, almost as if I had taken drugs. I don't encounter very many people who would come up to me and say, well, you're an idiot, I don't understand why you're doing this. You're obviously battling some inner demons if you, th if you feel that in order to fulfill your life, you have to drink blood. Um, because I don't talk to too many people outside of the scene about it and not many people outside of the scene know that I do it. The only person who really does know is my boyfriend and he's 100% supportive. You know, Sue told me about her blood drinking basically 
immediately. Michael, you're a really nice guy. I just want to tell you something. I mean, she was very proper about it. If she doesn't feed in a while, you will notice some very characteristic things about not feeding in a while. She'll get irritable. Um, she might get a little sick. Uh, she doesn't talk well. You know, she'll just want to hide in a corner. She won't want to go out and do things, except to go out and feed. And I just sort of have to go along with it. Craving blood is very unpleasant. Um, if I haven't fed for, say, four or five weeks, I do get pain. I get stomach pains. Uh, my eyes become more sensitive to light, and sometimes I'll get muscle cramps. I've tried supplementing my diet with a lot of protein, different kinds of protein, raw, steak, things like that, but nothing seems to work except for blood. If I can't find a human donor, I will get animal's blood. If I can find a butcher, I can order blood because some people use it for blood pudding or to make blood sausage. Or, barring that, I'll go to the supermarket and buy calf's liver and drink the blood off of that. Um, basically, I'll buy probably, depending on the size, three or four pieces of liver. I take it and put it in a blender and puree it and drink that. And that'll last me a couple of weeks until I can actually get to a human donor. I mean, I don't know how you feel about eating liver in general. Most people don't like liver, but it has a very metallic, very distinct flavor. If I'm not able to get people, if I'm not able to feed off of people, I do this about once a week. It's a little bit messy, but it's the way it is sometimes. The flavor's a lot more mild. It's not as gamey and harsh as beef is. Beef is really harsh. That's better. Now, generally, this I don't like this flavor at all. It doesn't taste good. The aftertaste is not good. Um, my, my initial reaction to it is pretty much disgust, like if you're taking, it's like taking medicine. You have to do it, otherwise you don't get any better. With human blood, it's much more intense and it lasts a lot longer. Um, the effect of human blood will last maybe a few hours. The effect of animal blood will only last maybe 20 or 30 minutes. Oh, vegetarians definitely taste better because, well, first of all, all blood does have a coppery, uh, sort of a thick taste to it. That's, that's common. That's common of all types of blood. But depending on what a person has eaten, you can tell what they've eaten. If somebody eats a lot of garlic, the blood is kind of bitter. If they eat a lot of uh, red meat, it's a lot thicker and stickier. It has a heavier flavor. But if somebody only eats vegetables, if somebody's a vegetarian, the blood is very, very sweet. And it also, it's also a little bit thinner and it flows better and you can get more. Like New York, LA also has a club scene to cater for its vampire community. Most of the clubs play hardcore industrial goth music and enforce some type of dress code. But one club Sue took me to had a VIP room with a difference. We're at Club Communion right now, and this is the uh, Vampire Club that has the feeding room. This is the best club in LA. Uh, communion has um, a feeding room which I've never seen in any other club around, and it's very carefully monitored. Only consensual feeders and donors are allowed upstairs. No one else is allowed up there. And we have somebody monitoring everything, make sure nobody gets hurt and everybody gets cleaned up properly. It's a little bit weird for somebody who's never seen it before. I've been involved in the scene in one form or another for over 10 years now, so seeing that is not terribly shocking. If anything, it usually makes me hungry. Everybody has different feeding habits. Some people will feed off of somebody on the neck, which
which is very dangerous. Some people, the shoulder or the back, which is good because later on clothes cover it and it heals up faster and it bleeds really well. Other people like to cut someone's arm. Some people, they do get a sexual rush out of it. Some of the feeders do and some of the donors do. So some of them may be partaking in a little bit more groping at this groping one another at the same time as feeding. There have been times when I haven't fed in a long time where I have viewed people as being nothing more than fresh meat. If somebody smells good and they look healthy, then they're definitely a candidate. In Hollywood, I was about to meet someone with a human blood disorder so rare that only 1,500 people have been diagnosed with it in the United States alone. Porphyria is a disease which prevents the human body producing enough heme, the main pigment in blood that gives it its color. If a person does not have enough heme in their system, they will eventually die. As a treatment, many porphyrians regularly undergo painful blood transfusions to replace the missing heme, while others prefer to take a more contested approach. Drinking blood is like having the first cigarette of the day. You know, it races through the system and for those of the, the smokers out there that are going to be watching this, it, it's a lot like that. It's like getting high. My condition, well, it's known as porphyria. Um, I've had it since the age of 17. I am photosensitive, but yes, I can go out in sunlight for roughly about an hour, being a level one that the doctors describe me as. Anything beyond that, and I start blistering, it's not a pretty sight. Even though Raven's porphyria is classed as level one, which is relatively mild, he may still be at risk of liver failure if he went untreated. When I first found out about it, I went through transfusions, hormonal treatments. I tried everything. Uh, the transfusions were very painful. Uh, the hormonal treatments ca caused me to be extremely violent. After going through the, like, the transfusions, the hormones and all that, drinking blood was the only option, so I pretty much took it. It had no serious negative side effects besides it tasted like crap. Right now we're here in uh, South Central LA. Um, here to pick up my uh, monthly uh, supply, I guess you could say, of blood. The main reason I use a kosher butcher is because, well, they happen to be the only ones that don't add a certain dye called Red 42. Uh, normally I, I mention that I, um, I'm, pr I'm purchasing the blood for like blood sausage and if he asks. Red 42 for normal use is to make the meat redder. It's, a, it's pretty much it's a preservative as well as it makes the meat look good. This is definitely a substitute for human blood. It, um, it's just one of those things that, you know, it, it, it avoids me having to deal with the donors. You know, co kosher butchers, they just, they slit the animal. It's there. But is it as good as human blood? Um, it's cold. <laughs> it's, uh, <clears throat> but yeah, it's, it, it does the trick. It does the trick when it, when it has to. To find a human donor in this day and age, it's like, it's, it is a real nightmare. You have to, like, you have to go through blood screening tests, and you gotta make sure that you've known the person for a long time. Yeah, I've, I've already phoned up Ordered Ahead, and these guys are really good about it. For anyone else to drink blood, you're gonna be in lots of pain, you're gonna be puking, you're gonna be a mess. Is this a hard thing to try and buy from a butcher? Um, actually, in most cases, yes, because they, if they know what I'm using it for, they tend to freak out, mostly. Um, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, but yeah, um... It's not something you find on the menu? It's, no. I mean, you can look the, down the whole list and you're not gonna find it. Um, it's just one of those things that, you know, they don't advertise. Uh, there's people out there like blood fetishes and all that that do this for kicks and thrills and what have you. I personally look at them and I'm going, why? I need this to survive. You're doing this for your thrills, your jollies, what have you. 
beef. Yeah, you're right. It's beef. If I don't drink blood, my liver will shut down. And unfortunately, when your liver's gone, game's over. I usually come to a like, park, find some place a little secluded, try and find a little bit more away from people. I am married, and uh, my wife does know that I have porphyria, and yes, that I do drink blood. You bring a container of some sort like uh, this and, you know, just get rid of it. She has made offers to me, and unfortunately, I, I cannot drink from my wife for the simple fact that she is a school teacher. It would be kind of hard to explain to her students why she has like cuts and scars upon her body. It would cause a lot of troubles within her work because people still view what I do as a taboo. Cheers. Uh, to those who would um, think that, you know, that I'm a crackpot, they've never been lying in a bed with the sensation of razor blades ripping through their stomach. They've never had to limit their daylight time. They've never had to, you know, go the, through the humiliation of having to go to a butcher or the, the, the processes of having to get donors. So for those people that don't understand that, you know, I have to drink blood, all I have to say to them is, you know, I'm sorry, but this is my life. Although Raven is convinced that consuming animal blood alleviates his condition, there is no medical proof that drinking blood can help any type of porphyria, and it is strongly contested by the medical profession. There are those, however, who firmly believe that drinking blood can have positive effects, and it is not just the major cities where they can be found. I travelled to the sleepy suburbs of Cincinnati where I found that living with a blood drinker can push a relationship to its limits. I wish the feeding were a little bit more romantic because I don't get anything out of it. I don't want it to be sexual all the time, but it would be nice if she didn't do it in as clinical of a manner. I don't see asking point blank, I need, I need blood, may I please cut you, as being clinical. To me, it's not about sex, it's, it's a physical hunger. About three years into the relationship, Sarah uh, came out and she told me that she was kind of a vampire and I didn't know quite what to make of it to begin with, but she said that basically it wasn't the kind of immortal undead vampire. She didn't sleep in a coffin or anything like that, but she basically um, wanted to, you know, had a need to drink blood. And when she first suggested it, it didn't repulse me. It wasn't something I had ever thought about before, but it didn't turn me off and it didn't turn into a big argument or anything. And I kind of went, well, if that's what you like, you know, if that's what's going to be part of our relationship, then, you know, that's fine. Scott and I have been together since about late 1993. We started out as, as friends who occasionally had a physical relationship and, and turned into something a lot more romantic. We are desperately in love with each other. We just haven't been getting along. Under ordinary circumstances, I like to drink blood maybe once or twice a week. Lately, it's been more like, uh, well, every, every several months. If I actually asked him, can, can I feed, he, he'd, he'd probably quite happily oblige. I think he'd rather I were more romantic about it. When I get desperate, I have a hard time being romantic. It's just, please, let's get this, let's just do this. We can be romantic later on, maybe, but my problem mostly right now is that I have a hard time even asking. Can you describe Sarah's mood when she hasn't fed for a while? She gets really irritable, really cranky. Physically, she seems drained, she seems slower, physically depressed. Um, she starts getting sick very easily. She starts uh, needing a lot of sleep, getting very tired very easily. And after we feed, I can notice a difference. Um, I can't explain it. I can't say there's a physical 
a physical difference or an emotional or energy difference, but she does seem to, whether psychosomatically or in reality, does seem to feel better, perk up, not be as irritable, uh, be able to take longer walks, be able to do more without tiring out as easy. Is this a good spot? Mm -hmm. I'm going to make a cut now. I'd explain why I need to drink blood to him if I actually understood why I need it myself. I've gone through various hypotheses. When I first came out to myself, I was obsessed with finding out why I was a vampire, why anybody would be a vampire. I, I've stopped asking why. I don't think there is really a logical reason. I just know that I need, so I deal with the practical aspects of it. Right now, since I'm actually on camera, um, I'm not focusing quite as much on him as I usually do. Um, under ordinary circumstances, I actually get high off of it. I wouldn't call it a sexual high, it's more of an emotional high. Definitely a physical high, too. Um, there have been times where I got a good mouthful. Um, not from him, because I don't cut him that deeply. There have been times that I got a good mouthful and I actually felt it almost going through my veins and I know that's psychosomatic because there's no reason it should feel like that, but that was my experience of it. Um, I tend to drown in it. So, it's something non-caffeinated for me. Right, you want caffeine free? I don't think the feeding itself, um, the problems with the feeding is really what's contributing to the major problems. If, you know, the feeding were to get easier, I think it would make the relationship run a little bit smoother. I think it's a fairly large factor, actually. I find it rather difficult to ask him for blood for a number of reasons. I don't like being dependent. Um, I feel bad about cutting him because I know he has very sensitive skin. It's not supposed to hurt at all. It hurts me when I see him wince. I'm a very romantic person, and when we're doing something this close between the two of us, I wish I don't need it to be like a sexual experience every time. Um, I wouldn't mind it being incorporated into our sex every once in a while, but uh, I wish it would be a little bit more something between the two of us rather than just, I'm hungry tonight. Sarah does not have regular access to vampire bars and clubs like the ones in major cities, but she told me that she can still correspond with other blood drinkers via the internet, and she runs her own website, which now has over 300 members. Websites and, and internet chat rooms and e-lists like the one I run are one of the major ways, sometimes the only way, that self-identified vampires can actually hook up with each other. I have my site up here, which I use to try to get rid of some of the uh, the more stupid myths that people hold about vampires, as well as some of the questions that people ask, like, am I a vampire? I keep getting asked that, and I'm like, eh, if you have to ask, you probably are. <laughs> Let's see if I can get you the personal section. Those are always interesting to read. Greetings all, I'm a 44-year-old male seeking a hungry female vampire to feed. I feel such a strong need to do this, so I long to watch as he drink the blood from my veins. I know the, the food to avoid and those to eat to make my blood sweet for you. I ask nothing in return. I'm not looking for sex or a relationship except that as a vampire and donor. I would also be interested in being part of a feeding circle if you have hungry friends. I look forward to serving you. Please contact me soon. That sounds like a fetish. <laughs> hey, you know. I was amazed to find out that every year there are gatherings for self-identified vampires held all over America. Sarah and Scott usually attend them, but this year Sarah has decided to hold her own gathering, mainly for the blood drinkers that she's been corresponding with on the internet for over a year. This will probably be the first time tonight that everybody here has met as a single group. I've never met most of these people before in my life. All of my parties end up turning either into orgies or, or like totally G-rated piles where people sit around reading Winnie the Pooh. I have no idea what, which this one's going to turn out to be. I don't think I need to be a psychic to sense that there's going to be some, some hanky-panky going on tonight. I just had a couple of lesbians making out on my lap. I'm about to check on a duck that I've been cooking. 
What do you have planned? What's on the agenda tonight? Uh, well, we're going to do a, a little um, a little circle where we synchronize our energy, and, and then we're going to to, to put to bleed into a cup of mead and, and drink from the cup. Now I want everybody to draw energy with their left hand and give energy with their right around the circle. And we'll do this for a little while. The meat actually is, is alcohol, so it sterilizes whatever germs might have been in, in the blood. We've all been tested for the really major stuff like, like HIV and things that the alcohol wouldn't kill. So this is just kill things like common colds and stuff like that because nobody wants to come home with a cold. First time I actually drank blood was four years ago. <laughs> It's almost like a drug, I almost get buzzed off of it. I mean, some people like the show, they like the flash and the glamour. Um, but there are other people who just love their normal everyday lives and you, they can walk down the street and you wouldn't look at them twice. A modern day vampire can be anyone. It can be your next door neighbor. You would never know. My subjects kept increasing. Even though the individuals I came across genuinely seemed to crave blood for a multitude of reasons, there is still no logical explanation as to why. I know that blood drinking has been around since pre-Christian times, and in some weird way, the people I met seem to be carrying on this underground tradition, attaching it to the vampire myth. I'm still no closer to understanding why these people drink blood, but what I do know is that the subculture is youthful and growing. And though I initially thought that it was confined to the United States, personal ads on the internet indicate that there are blood drinkers all over the world, including the UK. Find out more about Mark Soldiger's journey into the world of vampires at channel4.com forward slash talk, where you can chat to him live in a few minutes. Now, tomorrow at 5 past 11, the true story of how a young woman became a man in the Brandon Tina story. Next on 4, it's bad news for Ali McBeal. She's about to turn 30. The big... fires in Malibu Canyon. You can almost see from here. just so he can but when I met you at the corporate party I it'll be worth it I'll do things with you no one's ever done 